This commemorative plaque in Jerusalem is a sad relic of the period of British rule in Palestine, the Palestine Mandate. On one side, it's inscribed in Hebrew. On the other side, in Arabic, the language of the majority. The English version lies in the painful ground between these two opposing camps, so to speak. Heading the list of names there is that of Sir Herbert Samuel, Britain's first High Commissioner in Palestine. Sir Herbert Samuel's very first act when he came there in 1920 to rule Palestine for Britain was to make Hebrew an official language. He thus discovered without delay what was to be an inescapable rule of life for him and his successors for 30 years. If you pleased one side, you offended the other. The British began by offending the Arabs. There were perhaps 60,000 Jews in Palestine at the time and half a million or more Arabs. Why should this small minority of Jews, the Arabs asked, be given rights at all? The favor bestowed on the Jews by Sir Herbert Samuel made the Arabs angry and afraid. They felt it to be unjust. Unjust or not, Sir Herbert Samuel's action was unavoidable. Encouraging the Jews, fostering a Jewish national home was a duty. It was the justification of Britain's presence there and what the League of Nations mandate was mostly about. In appointing Samuel to implement that mandate, the British government left no doubt about the strength of their commitment to Zionism and the Jewish national home. For he was himself a Jew, as well as a trusty and reliable friend of the Zionist movement. Duty was made easier by personal inclination. Not unreasonably, the Arabs felt that the appointment of a Jew to the post of High Commissioner and the immigration of large numbers of foreign Jews with ill-defined and probably far-reaching political ambitions was likely to harm their interests. Feelings amongst these non-Jewish communities, as they were categorized in the League of Nations mandate, ran high. Arab feelings showed themselves even before Samuel's arrival in civil disturbances. Riots, fights, killings and arrests took place in 1920 and 21. These were sometimes associated with local religious festivals, which could turn easily into political demonstrations. What it all amounted to was something very simple. The Arabs did not want foreign Jews in large numbers in their country. The atmosphere in 1920 and 21 was tense. The Arabs complained bitterly about the way they were being treated. But all this was to no purpose. The new colonial secretary, Winston Churchill, visited Palestine in 1921. It is not in my power, he said then, to repudiate the Balfour Declaration. The mandate stood. The deal Britain had made, the undertaking given, and the British interests served by it, this is what mattered to the British. Arab unrest led him a year later to issue a white paper, calculated to cool them down. But on the crucial and explosive issues, the right of Jews to go there, to live there as of rights, to buy land, invest, build up their own political institutions, on all these, Churchill would not compromise. On these, he gave nothing of substance. It was this, the resolute and determined support given by successive British governments, which enabled the Jewish nationalist movement in Palestine to take root there and grow. This kibbutz was founded in 1921, the year of Churchill's visit, the first of many agricultural settlements established in the 20s. It bears the Hebrew name Ein Harod, the kibbutz of the well of Harod, the well from which, the Bible tells us, the soldiers of Gideon drank on God's instructions before they went to do battle with the enemies of Israel. It stands in the now richly cultivated Valley of Jezreel, Literally, 
the valley where God's seed shall be sown. It's a place which resonates with biblical associations, with the names of the prophet Elijah and the warrior Saul. The settlers who came here derived from this ancient past a profound sense of their own continuing identity and a deep, unshakable confirmation of their right to be there. Their own achievements in those early pioneering days have taken on in the mythology of Zionism an almost biblical or epic status themselves. The early 20s are a period which the Kibbutz Museum lovingly celebrates, a tradition which the old proudly pass on. The story of Jewish achievement in Palestine has genuine heroic qualities, rich material for an education which, as the British Royal Commission of 1937 dryly reported, produces a national self-consciousness of unusual intensity. The Jews had no doubts about their rights to this land. The gut feelings of ownership had been given formal legality by the League of Nations. Their great need for it was in itself an imperative which overruled all else. They had bought it, they argued, in perfectly proper legal transactions, and even sometimes paid compensation above their legal obligations to dispossessed peasants. And much of it they were to transform beyond recognition. In the great sweep of history and destiny of which they felt themselves a part, the presence of the Arabs was not their most pressing concern. Perhaps, some thought naively, the Jews could even help the Arabs to the socialist millennium. In the meantime, the Jews had grander preoccupations. We arrived here in 1920. And uh, after a short period of some road construction, so it was a very short period. We were settled on the top of a hill above the Sea of Galilee. There was no road to that place. You could reach it only by mule or by foot. Surrounded by rocks and completely desolate and completely isolated from the outer world by the difficulty of communication and transport. Uh, Footsteps were brought by mule. And here we lived 26 boys and girls who came directly from a completely different middle class atmosphere and surrounding and environment. People who studied at universities, colleges and so on and so on. And were suddenly transferred here first to very difficult and hard physical manual work. Secondly, to that complete isolation. And it put that group before it confronted it with the basic problems of life. What is life? Love, family, nation, people, interrelations. And there developed a kind of a particular style of life. 26 people who lived on the verge of starvation and under very difficult physical conditions, all in, in two rooms of a wooden shack, four girls in one room and the 22 boys in the other, uh, bed near bed, very few, very little space between. And they worked all the day hard. And in the night, there was a kind of symposium. People sat down on the field there, on the rocks, and talked. It was a part of confession, a kind of individual confession, partly a confrontation with the problems of life. What is it? With the problems of eternity. And there was a particular, I would say, semi-mystical atmosphere in that conversation which lasted deep into the night. 
and confronted that 26 isolated people on the top of the hill with the basic problems of life. It was a strain. It was a strain physically first after a, way of, after a day of hard work. But it was even more so spiritually. That tension, that feeling of confrontation, that atmosphere of the night with the lake deer down, with the wonderful Valansky, and faced with the gravest and deepest and most decisive problems of life. And talking about it, a kind of semi-confession, semi-dialogue, which probably was unique in the world. And we, 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 we had that feeling that here is something happening, trying to go into the depths of human problems.